So Shane, my first question is for you. Um, what draws you to the dark side of Hollywood when you're writing? <coughs> I think it, it's, it, it's really so much about, um, what, what fascinates me about Los Angeles as a private detective sort of nexus is this notion of a sort of dime store chic, that this is a place where it's still the end game destination for every American dreamer is to come out to this wonderful place called the coast where you'll get famous. But it's, there's a sort of allure that's kind of an illusion to that. And it's a trick where you get off the bus at age 20 and then age 40 you sort of spun around sun blinded and you look and you go, what happened? And it's the tragedy of this faded glory that LA represents, the best and the worst, covered in smog in the 70s, you know, submerged in pornography. The Hollywood sign is in tatters and no one's doing anything about it. I thought that was a great sort of faded uh, prom queen of a city mm -hmm. in which to then, you know, put these sort of tarnished knights in their slightly stained armor. And, you know, the more sort of uh, tawdry the backdrop in a way, the more elegant uh, you can be in the heroism of your two characters. Cool. Um, and you, I remember you saying that this was something that you thought kind of resembled the, the times now, like the things that they had to deal with in the 70s is what people are dealing with now, with like gas crisis and smog and pollution and everything like that. Do you think that the movie, especially with the, the theme of like the, the, um, the protesters with mm -hmm. pollution, do you think that that will resonate with younger audiences and drive them to come see this film? You know, I don't know what will resonate because there's an old expression in Hollywood, which is if you want to send a message, you know, call Western Union. <laughs> um, but if you display something in time, and you might find that there are parallels and things that you recognize in a movie that sort of reflect, you know, modern uh, issues and modern themes. I think just this notion of uh, people who are, you know, under pressure to succumb but somehow find the courage to go beyond what's being fed them and find out something, you know, the knit of the truth. That's, that's always going to be there. It's always going to be the basis for a private eye story. I hope that people are inspired by the, the characters, and not just as a, as a comedy, but actually as a story of redemption. If they, if they can take that away, that'd be great. Okay. Joel, you, you guys have worked together, uh, the first time was 30 years ago with Lethal, Lethal Weapon. 30 years from now, what do you guys see yourselves doing? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 Turning I, in my grave because he's still alive. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of like that concept sometimes, you know. So, you know, like, you know, so we met in 86, all right? So 30 years before that was 56. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, right. so if I say, you know, what was the world like in 56? Well, I was, I was about four years old. But still, I mean, it was a very different... I mean, Havana looks the same way as it, <laughs> L.A. did then. But, I mean, what was, what, what was the 30-year gap like, you know? And so... So I mean, you know, so yes, yeah, so so we worked. We met in '86. He wrote. He wrote. Uh, he was a 21-year-old kind of UCLA graduate. He wrote uh, *Lethal Weapon*, and it kind of just kind of made people think about this kind of genre and this kind of tone. His voice is a very singular, very special voice. So he sees and 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 characters talk in a way that. The lines in, in, in Lethal Weapon, you know, God hates me, well, hate him back, it works for me. Those were lines between Mel, uh, 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 Murta and, and Riggs. Or, mm. you know, you've killed a lot of people, I haven't killed you yet. I mean, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. And even though they're very simple, you know, dialogue, it's, it's conceptual. So he's carried that with him. And now we have a chance to <clears throat> kind of do it again in a fresher, more unique, bigger way. And, and, you know, where Kiss Kiss was a small movie with a very small budget and Donnie was on his ass and we weren't we're who we are. And now we have really Ryan Gosling, Russell Crowe in the real good version of this. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know what to, th I mean, you know, what, what will it be like in, you know, 2046? But I mean, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, you know, it, it's just, is at, as the as the business goes, we've kind of perfected this, and you know, I think we got it right now. You yeah. know, it's, uh, the thirty year, it took us thirty years to get it right, and it took uh, it took you know seventy five eighty years for the private eye to go from you know Dashiell Hammett to now. So, right. um, there's a tradition always of of living up to a legacy, and I think this one hopefully not only fulfills the legacy I have with Joel Silver creatively, but is true to uh, the private eye genre as well. You guys did an awesome job with this movie, by the way. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your time. Thank you. Was that on camera? <laughs> Please. Yeah.